Welcome back. Okay, well, we've gone over a lot so far, haven't we? But the beauty of a recording is that you can go over any area of it you want a second time. And besides, your brain actually needs repetition and time in order to consolidate and organize new information. In addition, aside from teaching you something new about your brain and body, this class is also in part a mental flexibility exercise, introducing new concepts and asking your brain to consider things we may have learned one way as kids in a different way now that we're adults. And you're doing a great job. I'm hoping that so far I've been successful in getting the idea across that your brain likes repetition and energy efficiency, sometimes to a fault. But we can learn to use this feature in a way that works for us and in our favor. And that our goal is really about getting our brains and our emotional response system operating more flexibly in a range centered around neutral calm. So as we go over this next section, don't get too hung up on scientific terms or the exact function of each brain area. Neuroscientists will admit that they still have so much to learn about the brain. And so over time, their data, as well as my understanding, will be updated and revised. And when that happens, I'll share those updates with you as we go. Again, the idea that I really want you to come away with is this. Number one, that the brain's operation is fundamentally similar to that of a complex, energy-efficient, self-reinforcing network that relies on repetition, diversification, and comprehensive use in order to stay strong. And number two, you actually can change your brain and behavior patterns, and emerging science supports this. So well, let's get to it. The cerebral cortex, or what I like to refer to as the workroom, is the largest area of the human brain network. Recent research estimates that our brain contains 86 billion neuron connections, connections that pass electrochemical signals to and from each other. That's an impressive number. Now, as we touched on earlier, the two cortical hemispheres of our brains are responsible for logical processing of language, complex skills, and our use of tools. It's also where social interaction, problem solving, planning, memory, and judgment are processed, as well as most of the input from our five senses. Now, as described in part two, these hemispheres can operate consciously, subconsciously, and unconsciously processing our thoughts, and in turn, directing our behavior. Now, although scientists observe certain brain activities more often in one side of the brain versus the other, both sides of the brain are designed to work together. This is the concept of operating with your whole brain. Like many of you, probably, I used to believe that being left or right brain dominant was a fact. But in actuality, it's a myth that's been scientifically disproven. Both sides of the brain can communicate and can be active for all tasks. Each of us may prefer to spend time in one activity over the other, thus creating many more of those neuron superhighways that we talked about. But unless we've suffered some sort of brain damage, we each have the ability to access and develop any skill set that we desire. The two cortical hemispheres are connected by a thicker wall of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. This fibrous nerve wall communicates and integrates information from one side of the cortex to the other. This just means that this wall of neurons helps us engage both sides of our brain at the same time. From a physical body standpoint, the right side of our cortex talks back and forth to the left side of the body, and the left side of the cortex talks back and forth with the right side of the body. However, in cases where one side of the brain has been damaged, the other side of the brain can actually learn to rewire itself in order to compensate. I used to work with patients who had strokes, and when the paralysis impacted their dominant side, 
they initially struggled to use their unaffected side with handwriting or daily activities like buttoning shirt. But with time and practice, their brains remapped a new path and their skills improved. That's pretty cool. And it goes to show you how flexible and retrainable our brains really are. So how can we influence the cerebral cortex or the workroom? Number one, through present attention and conscious selection. The most obvious way to influence the workroom of your cerebral cortex is through being conscious about and paying attention to what your brain is exposed to. But be clear, this can also happen passively and indirectly. This includes what we read, the music and the lyrics that we listen to, what we watch on TV, and even the people that we hang out with. The mind is recording and integrating everything all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. So be mindful of your environment, especially while you're healing or beginning the self-regulation process. Your brain is always paying attention, recording, recording and integrating what it's exposed to, even if you're not consciously aware of it. This intentional awareness practice or paying attention in the present moment also helps you to bring more of those unwanted subconscious thought patterns up into the conscious area of your mind. This is where you can make some of the most effective changes if you want to. Now, number two is through mindfulness and stillness practice. Remember how earlier today or in the last um, video, we talked about the differences between dynamic calm and still calm, right? And how being still and centered within our flexible regulated range had restorative and regenerative benefits. Well, researchers did this study where they put Buddhist monks through an MRI and studied images of their brains, comparing them to the brains of people who didn't meditate routinely. They discovered that consistent meditation or mindfulness practice actually strengthened areas of their brains. In particular, that wall of neurons that connects the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum, it was thicker, which means they had even more connections between the right and left sides of the brain. To me, that's great motivation to consistently practice stillness and meditation. I mean, the more connections I have between the two sides of my brain, the more I'm able to optimize my brain's function as a comprehensive whole. And I think we can all agree <laughs> that using more of our brains at any given time is a definite plus. Am I right? <laughs> Let's move on. 